Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Errol Zeki, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer at Sassman Wealth. On behalf of Philip Bradford, Sassman, and myself, we'd like to welcome you to this live webinar on investing in a post-COVID world. Today, we'll be focusing in on the investment outlook for uh, fixed income investments. These live webinars are something new that we are piloting while South Africa and much of the world is on some form of lockdown. Uh, this is the second webinar in a series of broadcasts we are calling Around the World in 21 Days. So please watch the space. There are more to come. Please bear with us if the technology gets grumpy. Uh, we didn't experience any issues in the first presentation of the series, but uh, you know, fingers crossed that we'll have the same experience today. Uh, thank you for joining us. We have over 400 attendees on, on this webinar. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please post them to the chat function. Uh, we will be identifying and combining the most common questions uh, during the talk, and we'll respond to those uh, after the formal part of the session. Just to state, this is not a COVID-19 talk per se, but Clearly, given the moment the world is in right now, uh, this is going to dominate much of the content of this series of webinars. For those of you who are clients, our business is fully enabled to operate remotely, so please do contact us via the normal telephonic and digital channels. But that's enough from me for the moment. Presenting today is Philip Bradford. Philip is the Chief Investment Officer at Sassman Asset Managers and is the fund manager of our flagship income and global multi-asset class funds, including the multiple award-winning Sassman DCI Flexible Income Fund, and Sassman DCI Balanced Fund. Philip started his career in 1999 at Investec, where he worked for nine years in asset management as a bond and interest rate trader. And then prior to joining Sassman in 2014, he spent six years at APSA Wealth in the role of Chief Investment Officer. Philip is a CFA charter holder, a member of the FTSE JC Index Advisory Committee, and a past president of the CFA Society. Thank you very much, Philip. Over to you. Thanks, Errol, and, and thanks everyone for joining today uh, in the, under these unusual circumstances. Um, firstly, I'm just going to be talking about the fixed income uh, outlook and asset allocation outlook uh, from an investment perspective. Um, for those of you who don't know Sassman Asset Managers that well, um, we've been around for a number of years and uh, we've built up particularly a capability in uh, fixed income and bond management as well as multi-asset class management. Uh, we've won a number of awards in that space uh, and uh, I'm going to be talking today, particularly in the context of our flexible income fund, which is our, our flagship fixed income building block for, for us, for our clients. And uh, in this instance, I'm going to be talking predominantly about local bonds. Um, firstly, I find that a lot of investors out there do not understand exactly what bonds are. Um, bonds are, in many respects, equities poor cousin and the boring cousin. And a lot of people who invest in equity markets are not really aware of how bonds work. So bonds, first and foremost, are tradable debt instruments. So ourselves as investors, we actually lend money to companies, to governments, to other entities as well when we buy bonds. Uh, it's very much like a loan, uh, except that the loan is listed and you can trade that underlying loan itself. The, the bond itself, uh, like a, a normal loan, pays a certain type of interest. So it's a, typically a fixed rate of interest every six months. And it's similar in many respects to a bank deposit. So if you actually uh, take out a fixed deposit with a bank, you're actually lending that money to a bank and they pay you a fixed interest for that, uh, for that period. And it may also be something like a floating rate interest or something that goes up and down with the prevailing interest rates. So both the capital and the income of bonds are guaranteed. And this is where it differs significantly from equities or the stock market. And um, because you don't have any share in the profits of the company, um, but you also know that your income stream that you're gonna get is exactly what was agreed up front. So despite what a lot of people realize, there's actually over 1800 bonds, 1841 bonds at last count on the JSC. But when we talk about uh, the all bond index, there's actually only 20 bonds uh, in the all bond index, which are actually fixed rate bonds that pay a, a fixed rate of interest and uh, they are predominantly government guaranteed bonds. So there are various types of bonds uh, in this universe that are significantly broader than just the fixed rate government bonds. Uh, these include variable rate bonds, which uh, the rates go up and down with interest rates or with the prime rate, uh, as well as inflation linked bonds, which are also a, a different type of instrument that are linked to the, the prevailing inflation rate. As I've said already, uh, bonds are very different to equities. Uh, because they, uh, you don't, you're not linked to the capital uh, of the company and your, your income is, is actually fixed, uh, it's actually a very much a lower risk instrument. And uh, as I've said already, bonds are, I suppose, the stock market's boring cousin. Uh, 
Bonds versus equities are, are something I think a lot of people um, struggle with the comparison. So here's a good example. Um, at the time, uh, when I looked at these rates quite recently, Standard Bank uh, were offering about 6% on a fixed deposit. Now, Standard Bank is actually the largest corporate exposure we've got in the funds. Um, so it's quite a, quite a relevant example. So you could, if you take out a fixed deposit with Standard Bank this morning, you should get 6% a year uh, for the next year. Um, you, you know exactly what the maturity is. You know exactly what your income is going to be. You're going to have no capital movements, but also no capital growth. And at maturity, you get 100% of your money back. Now, if you go and buy uh, some of the Standard Bank bonds that are tradable in the market at the moment, the two-year bond is yielding about 8.3%. In other words, if you buy the bond today, for the next two years, you'll get 8.3% in cash flow a year. In other words, if you put in 100 Rand, you'll get 8 Rand 30 every year. And at the end of the period, you get your money back. The same applies to the six-year bond, et cetera, as far as the different bonds are concerned. And banks in particular borrow a lot of money in the bond market because they borrow that money and then lend that money out to, uh, to, to uh, effectively those that want to borrow money from the bank. Now, if we look at Standard Bank's shares, the equity of Standard Bank, you can see that the maturity on the table on the slides has no maturity. So you never know what, if you put 100 Rand into Standard Bank shares today, you have no idea what your final value will be because there is no maturity. Uh, you don't know what the income will be. You, your income is the dividends of the company. And this is a variable number. It tends to be quite consistent with some companies, but as we're seeing at the moment, uh, all of a sudden when, uh, when economic stress is around, there's a good chance you might not get your dividends. And you also hope that those dividends will grow over time. Uh, the capital growth of a company is obviously variable and it's linked to the earnings growth of that company and you're hoping that the share price will go up, but you have no idea at any point in time what that capital value will be. And, and, and obviously the final value then is uncertain. So what do we take from this? Um, so if a standard bank had to go bust, and I, I must stress that the banks in South Africa are very well capitalized. Uh, you've got the the underpin of, uh, of not only a, a strong capital adequacy ratios and regulations, but also the overarching support of the likes of the Reserve Bank that is likely to assist uh, the banks if there is any trouble, particularly the larger banks, which are, are too important and probably too big to fail from a South African perspective. So the South African banks are in good shape and Standard Bank's a good example of that. But if something like a Standard Bank had to get into trouble like an African bank did a few years ago, what happens is the depositors are the first to get their money back. So depositors don't usually, particularly smaller depositors, don't lose their money. Next come the bondholders, and the bondholders are next in line because they own the, the debt of the, of the organization, and there's different qualities of debt, but they typically get uh, most, if not all, of their money, ba money back. Then the shareholders, uh, unfortunately, are last in line. So shareholders and preference shareholders as well usually take all of the losses and uh, in most instances don't get any money back. You tend to lose 100% of the capital. So a bondholder, uh, if, if something does go wrong with a company, if you lent them money, you tend to get most, if not all, of your money back. So uh, a, a very low, and again, as I said already, there's a very low risk of a bank like a standard bank going bankrupt. So this is the one question that I think most people don't understand. Um, why do bonds change in value? So if my capital is guaranteed and my income is guaranteed, why does the value go up and down? So let me give you an example. If you invest, five year, if, if you invest in a five-year fixed deposit today and the fixed deposit rate is 5% for five years. So in other words, if you put your money down, you put your 100 Rand down, for the next five years, you're going to get 5% a year at the end of, uh, end of five years, you're gonna get your 100 Rand back and you will have earned 25 Rand, in other words, 5% a year in interest. So you've got 125 Rand. Now, if tomorrow or later today, the same day, you did that fixed deposit in the morning and later that day, interest rates go up by 1%. Now you've just fixed your rates at 5% for five years, but now you could, if you had waited a few hours, unfortunately now you could have got 6% uh, for five years. And what that really means now is you're going to get 6% income a year. Your final capital is going to be 100 Rand. And at the end of the, the term, you're going to have 130 Rand. Now, what you've forgotten, of course, the opportunity cost was that extra 5 Rand. The difference between the two is, is 5 Rand. So 5 Rand, uh, the fixed deposit number one is worth 5 Rand less over the five-year period. And importantly, it's over the, five, the whole five-year period. 
It also means that fixed deposit number one on day one is actually worth 5% less. In other words, five rand over your initial capital invested. What that means, of course, if you wanted to then later that day cancel your fixed deposit with a bank, you would probably have to pay a penalty of 5% to get out of it because they would have invested at 5%. So, but what's also important to understand is you don't actually lose anything on the bond if you hold it through to maturity. So you, you do see a valuation or a mark to market loss as we would call it on a day to day basis. But effectively, if you hold that instrument through to maturity for the five years, you're still gonna get your 125 Rand back at the end. You're gonna have 25 Rands of interest um, and, your, and, and, the, uh, and obviously your capital back. So what's also important to understand, and this is the, the, the one thing that is just so important with fixed rate bonds. And you can see it from this example. If interest rates are going up, it's bad for bonds. But very importantly as well, if interest rates are going down, it's good for bonds. So, end of the lesson. Um, now, what happened in the past? What have bonds done over the last, uh, and this is since 1985, so over the last um, 35 years, what have bonds given us? And you can see from this chart here, um, and, and by the way, uh, inflation gave you just about 7.8 over that period. So we went through a, a long period of the 80s and the 90s uh, in particular, where inflation was, was at many times in double digits and uh, it's been lower over the last few years, but the average inflation over that time was about 7.8%. Interestingly, cash actually gave you about 2.5% above inflation over 35 years. Um, bonds gave you just over 5% above inflation for, for the last um, 35 years. Global bonds with the RAND appreciation, and it's so important to appreciate this, that the RAND was about uh, two to the dollar at the start of 1985. It's now obviously around about 19 or 18 and a half to the dollar. And the depreciation over that time is about five to 6% a year. So global bonds have given you a return um, with the RAND depreciation of roughly about the same ironically as, as, uh, as local bonds, which is about 12 and a half percent a year. Now um, property has given you just over 14% a year. Global equities gave you just over 15% a year with the RAND depreciation. And local equities actually beat global equities even with the RAND depreciation. So ironically, uh, even if you, if you uh, immigrated to Canada or Australia, uh, it would actually been better to leave your money in South Africa invested in our stock market. And this is including even the last fall that we've seen uh, in, in the last month. Now, what was important during that time was your optimal portfolio, if you combined all of these, was that uh, you got about inflation plus six out of that. Now, what is so important to understand was this period of time for equities was a very, very good period. Um, global equities did well, local equities did well, and over time, equities only give you about, in, uh, local equities in South Africa have been the best performing stock market in the world over the last 130 years, and they only did inflation plus seven. So equities giving you a, a significantly greater return than that was actually during the very, very strong times of the 80s, the 90s, and the early 2000s. Now, what has happened recently? Um, this is actually just showing our, our flexible income fund, just as gives you an illustration, because I manage a fund in bonds that uh, flexibly invests in different types of bonds, and, and we've got the flexibility to move in and out of the bond market at different times. Um, year to date, what you can see on the left hand side is that equities are down over 20%. In other words, the JSC is down over 20% uh, to the end of March. Um, the property market was down 48% over that period. The bond market itself actually fell by um, 8% or nearly 9%, which was actually the worst period. Uh, March was the worst period we've ever seen as, a, as far as a sell off is concerned in our bond market. And I'll cover that in more detail later. Um, and then what we've got is the, uh, we've been able to, we were able to only fall by about 1% to the end of March across the, the fund I manage, mainly because we were able to go into different types of bonds and cash um, from the start of the year. So we, we were able to navigate some of that, uh, uh, some of the volatility. Um, importantly, over the longer term, what we've been able to see is that um, we've been able to, to do a, a better return over the last uh, nearly five years now um, then you have been able to get out of the stock market, the property market, or the bond market. So what we've seen from uh, our, the way we kind of manage money as well, 
is by having a combination of some of the fixed rate bonds and then the cash or the floating rate bonds typically gives us a better return than just buying the bonds directly or just investing in, in some of the shorter dated instruments. But that's what's, what happened in the past. And what's quite important, by the way, is not only was last month the worst period in our South African bond market history, um, but Nenegate, which was uh, just over four years ago now, was the second worst time. Um, so importantly, in this kind of period, we've actually had the two biggest sell-off in our bond market history, um, and we've still been able to generate positive returns over that period, which gives you a sense of the kind of risk you're taking in, in bonds as investments. So what is the outlook from here? Um, the past doesn't help us very much. Um, we, we need to understand what's going to happen going forward. So I'm going to talk about downgrades. I'm going to talk about growth and interest rates, and I'm going to talk about some of the other asset classes as well. First and foremost, a downgrade doesn't mean the end of the world. Um, this is an example showing Brazil, and you can see that Brazil, actually, who got downgraded to junk in, uh, in early 2015, um, you can see, and this is their 10-year bond. Remember, with a bond, when the yield goes up, that's negative for the bond, and when the yield comes down, that's positive. So in other words, when interest rates are going out, it's negative, when interest rates are coming down, it's positive. Now, what happened with Brazil, if you look back to the, in 2014, they were borrowing, rate, their 10-year borrowing rate was around 11%. And then they started getting into trouble. It was roughly about the same time South Africa was starting to get into trouble as well economically. Um, Brazil then uh, got downgraded by the S&P. By and you can see their bond yield got to nearly uh, just under 17%, around 16.8%, uh, around about the time, uh, roughly about the time when Nenegate was happening, ironically. Then you'll see later on Moody's came to downgrade. So similar with South Africa, S&P downgraded first, and then later Moody's came. What you'll notice though, is that the bond yield started coming down just before the Moody's downgrade. And then more importantly, over the last um, five years, we've seen a huge appreciation in, uh, in Brazil's bonds. Uh, their bond yield currently, uh, their 10 year bond yield is around 8% or just below. And just before the coronavirus sell-off, which you can see right at the end here, uh, their bond yield was around 6.5%. Very importantly, at the start of the coronavirus um, uh, sell-off, Brazil was actually two notches below us, still in junk status. Now, if we look at Russia, Russia was a very similar example. We had a very big sell-off just before um, uh, Brazil, actually. Um, they also sold off to around 16% of their bonds. S&P and uh, Moody's then downgraded them. And then subsequently, we've seen a very strong appreciation in the, in, in the Russian 10-year bonds. Um, Russia actually is back in investment grade status, and that process was completed in uh, the February of 2019. Now, if we, if we push forward to South Africa, you can see that at the start of 2015, our 10-year bond was actually just below 7%, which meant that the government, who borrows about 4.5 to 5 billion rand a week currently in our bond market, was borrowing at around 7%. Um, with Nenegate uh, and the scandal around that, you can see how severe the sell-off was. And we, we then, uh, a little while later, got downgraded by S&P and Fitch. And you can see effectively how the market itself downgraded us from a price action perspective long before the rating agencies came along and downgraded us. Um, we were ticking along, uh, almost waiting to see what Moody's would do. And we actually, after the, the budget speech, um, which came out relatively positive, um, most people thought that Moody's would probably not downgrade us. But then the coronavirus scandal came along, and uh, or coronavirus crash, sorry, not scandal. And uh, we saw a huge sell-off in our bonds. And a lot of it was driven by a global events that had almost nothing to do directly with South Africa. And then we saw a correction in our bonds. And then after the correction, uh, Moody's came to, to downgrade us. So actually, ironically, um, on the, the, the Monday after da Moody's downgrade us uh, on Friday night, we actually had quite a strong rally in our bonds. So the bonds actually had factored in the downgrade noise long before uh, uh, Moody's came and downgraded us. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So next, what's the, what's the outlook for global interest rates? Now, this is a 700 plus year chart. And it shows you the correlation between growth and interest rates. Um, what's been quite important to see right on the right hand side of the chart is that over since 1990 onwards, really, we've seen a big fall in, uh, of global growth and inflation uh, were trend lower. And you'll see how closely correlated interest rates and global growth are. 
Um, this, if we, if we push it forward to what's been happening, even before the coronavirus, we were getting to near zero interest rates. Uh, and I've been of the view for quite some time that we're going to get, once the US growth started slowing down, we would get to zero rates in, uh, in America. Um, we've seen it now that uh, once the coronavirus um, pr problem started, interest rates have gone down to zero pretty much everywhere in the world, uh, in the developed market world. And what it means as well is that growth is low. So interest rates might be very low and some might argue artificially low, um, but it is being driven by very, very low growth rates. It's so important to understand that the developed market countries, uh, Europe, Japan is the perfect example, and America to a large extent as well, have more old people than young people, and they are effectively in retirement. Uh, they've also taken on a lot of debt, and it's very, very difficult for them to grow, and actually quite normal when you're in retirement to actually have expenditure greater than your income. And it's likely to continue for quite a few years. So the interest rate environment globally is pushing for lower interest rates. And that is, that is pushing South Africa's rates lower as well. Global growth was already slowing down before the, um, the coronavirus crash. And, uh, and, and I think we, we're blaming it a lot on the coronavirus crash. And there's no doubt it's, it's caused massive economic um, uh, catastrophe really at this stage and it's likely to normalize a bit after the coronavirus is, uh, uh, story has settled down but global growth was slowing down before that. Equities, I, I won't go into too much detail but equities at these levels if you look at on a, a rolling 10-year earnings basis equities are still quite expensive in the US and this was a, a week or so ago. Um, now what's quite important to look at as well is equities valuations as much as they're much cheaper than they were they're a lot more expensive than they've been, particularly on this basis, if you compare it to uh, the, 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 the crash in 2008 or in the, in the 80s and the likes as well. So while equities have sold off a lot, um, I, I think there's still a lot of potential downside if the earnings don't improve dramatically um, after the end of the, uh, the coronavirus. Um, what does this mean of these kind of valuations of a, a 17 to 19 valuation range? Um, what we would look at is, is forward returns of the, of the S&P 500 would only be roughly between sort of minus 3 to 7% a year. Um, whether it comes out at the average of 1.3 is not really the point. The point is of these sort of valuations, it's unlikely to expect double digit returns out of equity markets. And the South African equity market is closely linked to the global market. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail there and I'm happy to take questions, but the outlook for equities is not, doesn't necessarily mean we're going to see a, a, a rosy uh, equity bull market from here. We're at the back end of the, the longest bull market in history from an American perspective. So it's quite unlikely that we're going to see very, very high returns from global equities given how low the growth environment is. What is important to understand, though, is that the interest rate differentials between South Africa and Europe and America are, are close to their all-time highs, if not the all-time highs. Normally, the gap between our 10-year bond yield and uh, or our equivalent 10-year bond yield of, the, of Europe and US's is about 4 to 5% a year. That 4 to 5% essentially compensates you for the inflation differential between the, the two countries or zones, as well as uh, any kind of additional sort of country risk. What you'll notice from December 2015 onwards, in other words, Nenegate, our interest rates stayed high and have now gone even higher, where the rest of the world has continued lower and in many instances are, are negative in, in these sort of instances. And that is the 10-year rate. What has really changed in South Africa is the difference from our 10-year bond out to the longer end. There's about an extra 2% interest that can be gained by investing in, in bonds or interest rates longer than the 10-year area. And you can see if you look at our, our yield curve on the right-hand side of this slide, your, your, your three-year rates are, are still quite low, where your longer rates are, are nearly 12% on some of the bonds that we can get. So, and then obviously the gap between us and Europe is even greater than that. So when the gap is as wide as this, it makes it a very attractive looking investment to, to foreign investors. So even if they buy our bonds and hedge out the currency, they can still earn a decent positive return. So what did we expect at the start of the year for, for equity markets and bond markets? Um, we got this information on a survey that was done of local asset managers um, and what they, they thought the next five years returns would be per year from the different asset classes. 
And you can see that they thought that equities and property would give you about 12% a year. They thought that bonds would be about 9% a year. They thought that cash would be just under seven. Uh, they thought that global equities would give you about 10 with the RAND appreciation and global bonds would give you about 6% return. Now, that, the global equities and global bonds includes RAND appreciation. Now, at the start of the year, we were looking at about 10.5% yield on uh, the bonds we're holding across our portfolio. And I wasn't nearly as bullish on, uh, uh, on, on equities as a lot of the other people out there were. Um, the fact that we've been proved right is not really the point because no one was expecting a crash in equities. But given the valuations where they were, I was expecting sort of low to mid sing single digit returns out of equities. And importantly, we, we were yielding, uh, getting yields closer to 105 to 11% with much, much, much lower risk. It's just starting to make a lot of sense to look at those assets rather than domestic equities. So in my balanced funds where I manage um, equities uh, locally, globally, as well as bonds and, and property, I've been sitting at very, very low levels for the last few years in local equities because I've been able to get a yields of around 11% out of, out of instruments that are much, much lower risk. What's happened subsequently now in the, in the recent sell-off and some of the, the issues we had with the bond market was we, I've been able to buy yields around 13%, in some cases even higher. Some of the government bonds are a little bit lower today, but I can still get pretty much about 12% out of government guaranteed bonds. And then some of the other bonds uh, from some of the, the other gov government guaranteed or parastatal type bonds, I'm getting about one to 2% higher than that. Now those sort of returns are, are more than I'm expecting to get out of equities for the next five years. And very importantly, they, they are like 20 year, 25 year fixed deposits that are, are virtually guaranteed to give me those returns. Um, and and uh, they, again, are much lower risk than the, than the equity type returns we're gonna get. We do experience some volatility of returns as we've seen over the last while, but we know that that income that the bonds give us is consistent and it comes through regardless of what happens to the underlying capital. So what's also important to understand is that everyone's view on interest rates was wrong too. So interest rates are probably going to go down into the fours sometime soon. We're already around 5.25 on the repo rate. I'd be very surprised if we're not 100 basis points lower than that between now and the end of the year, potentially even lower. So there's a lot of room for us to cut interest rates further. Inflation is still falling away. Um, so the Reserve Bank, even with their inflation targeting, I think inflation is going to surprise to the downside. So what do you do when interest rates are coming down? Well, you buy a fixed rate. And the fixed rates, if I can get anything over 12% in this sort of time, uh, it becomes a very attractive investment. Now I'm allocating very cautiously into the space. I'm still sitting with lots of cash and lots of other investments that I'm looking to rotate into the fixed rate bonds, because I don't for a moment think that this uh, coronavirus uh, uh, sort of catastrophe is just gonna blow over very quickly. I think there's still gonna be some economic fallout. Uh, we've got South Africa coming out of the, the World Government Bond Index at the end of the month. Um, so I'm watching a lot of these events very closely and into any of the weakness, I'm just fixing rates for investors at, at these nice high yields. And what's quite important is if we get, get to inflation down into the threes and cash into the fours, what it means is that if I can lock in uh, bonds at around 12%, that's effectively inflation plus eight, inflation plus nine type returns, which are more than the best performing stock market has done over the last 130 years. So we for once have got the, the favorites in the horse race giving us better hot odds than the outsider. So again, we're yielding around 11% in the fund that we manage at the moment. I've owned about 40 different bonds across the portfolio. So there's lots of mainly bank and, uh, and then some government and parastatal type exposure. Uh, we're very cautious around how we manage the fund. Um, but essentially, what, we, what we're looking to do is generate the best RAND return um, possible for investors. Errol, I don't know if you want me to take some questions at this stage. Hi, Phil. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Yes, thank you. We have, we have had a few uh, questions uh, coming in. I think let me start with one of the, the latest ones, uh, or a few that have been coming through. Basically, just asking, saying, you know, we do have higher yields in, in, in South Africa um, compared to international or developed market um, bond yields. But given sort of the um, ongoing expectation for the RAND to depreciate against the dollar, and I don't know if that's really from this levels, but I suppose given the historic trend of the RAND against the dollar, does it still make sense uh, from a dollar perspective to be in South African bonds? Yeah, so 
The rand over time will lose in line with inflation differentials, and we've seen that consistently. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, the rand, even during the, the wild currency movements that we've seen over the last 20 odd plus years, um, we still see the rand typically losing five to 6% a year. What is important is it's lost a hell of a lot in the last short while. So we've had the biggest sell-off now, and rand's at its all-time uh, all high against the dollar. In other words, it's all-time capital low. And, and the rand is showing up now is actually probably the, one of the cheapest, if not the cheapest currency in the world. And our bonds are showing up um, compared to other emerging markets is probably the cheapest. Uh, Brazil, as an example, are two, or one notch below us now into junk. And their yields are, are two, nearly 3% below ours in that 10 year space. <clears throat> Excuse me. So a lot of the bad news is probably factored into the price. Um, and it's highly unlikely that the rand is going to continue to depreciate forever. Now, at some point, it will probably start normalizing when we've already seen it that foreign investors are starting to, to, to sort of come back a bit to the RAND. Now, I'm not making a call that the RAND's going to be back where it was just before the coronavirus anytime soon. Um, but I, it does, it's a bit like a rubber band in a way. It reaches a point where it can, where it can only go so far because the yields become so attractive that foreign investors start coming in. And if you're going to hedge the RAND, you're effectively betting against our interest rates. So um, the, the interest rate differential starts to burn quite badly. If the interest rate differential is 10% between us and uh, another country, let's say like Europe um, on their interest rates, then, then you, you need the rand to depreciate 10% a year just to break even on your hedge. So it becomes, uh, you'll see the hedges come off quite quickly. But what's more important to understand is, is what is the risk in our local bonds? Now, our government bonds in particular are still ironically the lowest risk investment in South Africa, lower risk than investing in uh, bank deposits, in equities, and a lot of the other investments available. And there's one of the simple reasons for that is because the local bonds are issued in rands and the Reserve Bank can very easily uh, uh, print more, more money effectively to service that. We can raise taxes very easily overnight. We can increase fuel tax, we can increase income tax, we can increase corporate tax, which will allow us to service that debt. And we can also then look for certain kind of bailouts and the likes to, to, to help service that debt. What's important to understand as well as the holders of South African debt, while there are a lot of foreign holders who own over 40% of our fixed rate bonds, and quite happily, by the way, um, they, a lot of the holders are still local pension funds, local banks, um, the likes of the government employees pension fund uh, by the PRC. Um, so if you're going to have any problems with your debt, it's more likely to be on the dollar debt uh, that South Africa has. So our biggest problem right now in South Africa is that our borrowing costs are too high. And the market is starting to realize that and the, and the bonds yields are starting to come down a bit again. And we should be borrowing at a much lower yield. And this is what's going to be pushing, I think, our interest rates lower. And it's going to be pushing the, uh, the National Treasury to issue more shorter dated bonds as well, like we're starting to see in the weekly auctions. And that's quite a positive bullish um, scenario for, for the South African bonds. So I'm not saying South African bonds are without risk, but they are, they've reached a point now where the yields are very, very attractive, in particular compared to pretty much all of the other alternatives. So myself as a, as a bond investor today, if I go and invest in, let's say, a money market fund or cash, and if the repo rate is 5.25 at the moment, and I can get pretty much nearly 7% more than that, um, it's a very, very expensive uh, position to go and sit and only earn 5 or 6% in cash if I can earn double digits in, a, in an instrument like a bond. So it's almost becoming riskier to sit in a, in a floating rate or a cash type investment than it is actually to, to earn, uh, to, to sit in a bond because the yield is so, so much higher. You know, I grew up in a yield environment where uh, cash rates were 11% and the long bond rate was about 7%. It's now cash rates are five and the long bonds are, are 12. Um, it's a bit of a dream come true for investors and anyone, whether you're 25 or 85, um, you should be looking at bonds because they are giving you capital growth type returns out of, a, out of what is traditionally a, a low risk investment. Thanks, Phil. Um, just, I mean, I, I think it's a slightly um, uh, different question. I, I just see a few questions coming through asking about the differences in bond yields, for example, the R209 versus the 186, et cetera. Perhaps just, um, just a, a, a 60 second uh, 
uh, explanation of, of the yield curve and, and, and the differences in yields at, at, at uh, different time horizons? Yeah, so f firstly, the South African R bonds are, are badly named. Um, if they just named them after the date they, they mature in, it would be much easier. So the, the R186 is basically a six year fixed deposit. The R209 and et cetera is a longer dated maturities. I think the 209 is 33. Uh, luckily the 2040 bond matures in 2040, the R2030 matures in 2030, et cetera. So really at the end of the day, um, when you invest in a, in a one year fixed deposit, you, uh, you expect a higher rate than you do from cash. When you invest in a 10 year fixed deposit, you expect a higher rate than the one year rate. And, and the way things are working right now is, is we're getting seriously compensated to invest in a, like a, a 2040 bond or a 2048 bond from South Africa. In other words, it matures in 2048, so it's effectively a 28-year fixed deposit. And that is giving us a yield of roughly about 12%, um, where your shorter data, the R186, is, is sort of around about to, just under 10% at the moment. It's uh, dropping around to that level. So you, you've got... Basically, different maturities. It's no more complex than a than a bunch of fixed deposit rates. Phil, and then we, we have a few questions coming through. Uh, you know, now now that we've been downgraded and the, the rebalancing that uh, will be happening, I think it's at the end of at the end of April. That's us falling out of certain indices. Could you just maybe put a little color on that? Yeah. So. You know, back if we go back before the financial crisis, if you got downgraded a junk, it was a it was a serious problem. Mainly because uh, it once you became junk status, it, junk is a sort of a jargon, but it, it basically means non-investment grade. And uh, anything above, uh, anything below investment grade, you you sort of now call junk. And in those days, pension funds and the likes weren't allowed to buy non-investment grade bonds, or many of them had it in their mandates that they couldn't and many funds and investments as well couldn't. What has changed quite a lot since then is because there are a lot more um, countries bonds that have moved into that and, and corporates as well, there's been a lot more issuance into that space. Um, there are a lot more uh, non-investment grade bonds out there. So when you drop, it's a bit like getting dropped from the, the C team, rugby team or soccer team to the D team. You kind of move into an, another league, I suppose. Um, uh, like I showed with Brazil's bonds and Russia's bonds, it's not the end of the world. It does mean you just got a different class of investors. So what has happened is that it's not as severe as it used to be to get downgraded to junk. And, and also the, the bond investors are the, the smart investors, the forward looking investors, and they factored it in a long, long time ago. And that's why you saw on the, the, the day effectively after we got downgraded to junk, our bonds actually appreciated in value. So whilst there might be some uh, selling uh, towards the end of the towards the end of the month, um, quite a lot of those investors might hedge out the currency, uh, and others might be strong buyers going into that. So they've been they've been waiting for this. Like I've been waiting for the last uh, four years and longer, um, saying that the opportunity to buy South Africa's bonds will be round about the time we do get downgraded to junk, because that's normally almost without exception that you see improvements from there. So it's not the end of the world when you get downgraded to junk um, because the, the damage almost gets done in the lead up to that. Thank you, Phil. We, we are getting quite a few questions around the flexible fund itself. Um, uh, just you know, a little bit more understanding around you know, capital losses um, over the short term in a period like this versus sort of longer term yields in the outlook for the next three to six months. I know you did touch on some of this a little earlier, but there's quite a few questions just to understand how a fund of this nature where you do have capital volatility um, and, and, and longer term yield, how that balances out over time and, and, and how you see that going forward. Yeah, and, and, and capital volatility, like I showed on that fixed deposit example, um, you know, if you bought a five year fixed deposit with a bank and you, and you were down 5% the next day, you wouldn't be too happy. Um, but, but essentially it's, it's about opportunity cost of interest rates. So first and foremost, the sell off in the bonds were, were incredibly severe, mainly because of liquidity issues. So uh, what had happened is, is the banks ended up um, holding to a lot of the bonds. Uh, I can go into much, a lot of detail on that, but a long story short, they were, they were, uh, a lot of bonds were sold to them because they make a market in the bonds. And then for technical reasons around uh, their reserve ratios and the likes and the bank rules, they were being forced to sell the bonds 
and their liquidity dried up in the bond market. And when you need to sell something urgently and there's no buyers, the, the, uh, the price falls quite dramatically. So that has been sorted out largely now by the Reserve Bank coming back to the market. You had similar issues in the US uh, on their corporate bonds, and you've seen the, the Fed and other central banks also come into the bond markets and say, hang on, we'll, be the, we'll buy these bonds, uh, we'll assist keep liquidity going, and we've seen the fixed rate bond yield settle down a lot there. What we've also seen though is we've seen investors that need to liquidate assets or having outflows as an example, end up selling some of their better assets. So it's a bit of like selling your, your, the family silver sort of to pay off debt in a way. Um, we've seen some of the, the bank bonds in the floating rate space, so not very recently in the last week or so, uh, some of the, those uh, floating rate bonds which have been very, very stable and haven't moved for a very long time. Uh, that's typically what most of the income funds hold. We've seen some of those sold off mainly because there's some forced sellers in the market and, and a lot of uncertainty around that space. And also all of a sudden, uh, an income fund that was giving you, uh, you know, cash plus one, maybe cash plus two, when, uh, when, when interest rates were eight was great, but when interest rates, if they go down to four, that's not so great. So um, the income, your traditional income funds are probably gonna give you, a, if you're lucky, about 6% going forward. So we're starting to see just some selling pressure in that area. Now, as I mentioned as well, though, if you hold these bonds through to maturity, um, basically they, they, they give you back um, all of the losses. Where in an equity market, you, you, your losses can be permanent. So really at the moment, we've seen a revaluation of a lot of these bonds, which actually had appreciated over time. So they've kind of normalized a bit again and probably sold off a bit too far. So once the coronavirus uh, situation calms down, I would expect quite a few of those to settle down again. Um, but very importantly for investors in income funds and bonds from here, um, you know, like flexible income at the moment, we're yielding about 11%. And that's a, we've only got about 30% exposure to fixed rate bonds. So I'm gonna be buying more and more into any weakness. Um, but what that really means is you're getting nearly a percent a month in interest. The cash flow is gonna come. It's the capital that moves and uh, moves around a bit, which means over the next 12 months, if things stay exactly the way they are, if interest rates don't move, I'll just park that for a moment, but if interest rates stay the way they are and bonds yields stay exactly the way they are, you're gonna get a cash flow of close to 11%. Now, after fees, it's about 10.5%, as that's a gross yield. So you're getting nearly a percent a month in interest. So if there is some capital volatility, a lot of that is a wobble during the, the period, but the income comes through uh, every day. At, uh, your, your NAV grows a little bit by the, the interest you're earning, and then it gets paid out um, every quarter. So, so really, if you're in an income fund and you have seen some, some short-term losses at the moment, that really is a revaluation. And, and it should come out in the wash over the next few months. Um, so I wouldn't be panicking in that space because essentially everything that's held in an income fund is a guaranteed instrument. And as long as there aren't any outright defaults in the underlyings. And, and you know, as I said earlier, I'm holding banks and insurance companies almost entirely. My biggest holdings are Standard Bank, First Rand, EBSA, Nedbank. You know, the, those aren't entities that I'm worried about uh, defaulting uh, anytime soon. Thank you, Phil. Um, I just see we've had quite a few questions coming through in terms of, um, you know, should I be selling my equities and, and buying bonds um, and those types of things? And just um, from, you know, just from a, from a Sassman Wealth perspective, uh, absolutely not. You know, that's not at all what we're saying. This, this presentation is very much um, around income and understanding income markets. And we talk about relative valuations. They are exactly that. They are relative valuations. You know, for us, the message from us has been very consistent through, throughout this volatility since the coronavirus um, uh, has been on the scene, that the most important thing is to remain diversified and to remain invested. You know, this isn't a, a punt into a particular asset class. It's just we've been covering different topics as we, as we go. So um, please, very strong message um, in this volatility. Stick to your investment plan. Um, I think there are definitely opportunities within both the bond space as well, the equity space to make changes. And your portfolio manager or equity manager or bond manager in Philip's case is definitely looking for opportunities within that asset class in this environment, but uh, we are not making, or sh you should not be making any wholesale changes to any of your, of your asset allocation. Yeah, Philip. and, and I, I think what's important here as well is, you know, when you're making an asset allocation decision, you're making a five, 10, 15, 20 year type decision. And, and I invest in local equities, I invest in uh, global equities as well. And there are good opportunities in that space. Um, I would suggest, though, that the norm in the old days, you know, in the sort of 
the 90s and uh, probably even early 2000s was to maybe hold 60% in local equities and only you know 10% offshore equities and then some other bonds and cash. Um, I, I think you should just revisit that as a, as a starting point, um, mainly because I think the, the, the yields and bonds have become more attractive on a five, 10, 15 year basis. I think use an opportunity of equity bounces and I think we're likely to see a strong bounce at some point to, to probably just rebalance your, your risk a bit. Um, and, and it's more, I, I think, for, for newer money type investors as well, uh, don't ignore the bonds. And, and, and I think for me, what's, what's so important is that bonds have been ignored. Um, largely, only really your institutional investors have been buying them um, over the years. Um, there wasn't a lot of credit around that you can invest into. So there's a whole new area of corporate bonds that you can buy that are giving us high yields. So the world is not as simple as just government bonds and equities anymore. There's a lot of instruments out there. And, and I think, um, you know, use these opportunities to probably rebalance the asset allocation. Uh, uh, and, and the good news is as well, as I think that the bonds in South Africa are not a, an anti-equity bet. So in the environment where local equities start to improve, like the local uh, property, the local uh, uh, banks, the local retailers, et cetera, um, bonds will likely to improve as well. Um, but importantly, in that environment, your, your RAND's probably strengthening too. So uh, just, just bear in mind that, um, that from these sort of levels, you can see very good returns from both of the asset classes. Um, at some point, you know, property, which is down 50% over a, a month or so, uh, really, really has to bounce. Um, but I, I think understand the interlinkedness between these different asset classes as well. And, and you need to have a, a healthy dose of bonds in your portfolio from here on out in your asset allocation, whether you're a growth investor or, a, or an equity investor. And, and uh, it's, it's useful to have both and to diversify, um, but don't, you know, don't only do one or the other.